Hi, I am François Neredo and welcome to the Boston List Meeting of two 2012, June 28th at uh, MIT. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Sussman for having us here at the MIT. And today, our speaker is uh, Kalman Reti, who will uh, demonstrate uh, for us uh, symbolic list machines. So, Kalman, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, um, I have uh, a bunch of slides, which are probably way too long, and I'm going to skip some and uh, go through them quickly. Um, I'm also uh, going to demo some stuff, which is also probably way too long, and which I'll probably go through here quickly. But if anybody has any questions or um, wants to know more, you can co contact me at my Gmail address. So what's a list machine? Well, it's a single user workstation, uh, an old single user workstation, that's basic goal in life was to optimize the development of software in Lisp. And it, for its day, was a very forward-looking thing that it sounds prosaic these days, but uh, you know, it had a high-resolution black and white bitmap display and a keyboard with lots and lots of extra keys, a mouse, you know, three-button mouse. All of that stuff was new. <laughs> and, um, but the most important stuff about the Symbolic Lisp machine, and which wasn't shared by the other variants of Lisp machines, was that there was an incredible amount of software and developed at Symbolics. And there were several hardware innovations in the architectures of the Symbolics versions of the Lisp machines that were also pretty uh, unusual and interesting. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. So we had, at Symbolics, we had essentially four models of Lisp machine. The first was called the LM2. It was a repackaging of MIT's CADR, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the second one was called the 3600 because it was a 36-bit machine, and we, the zero zeros were for the fact that we had planned to have multiple models that have different digits down there. Um, the next one was called the G machine internally. It was the same architecture as the 3600, but it mostly was intended to uh, make use of gateways and uh, commodity parts for serial and ethernet and stuff like that. All of that logic had been done in discrete logic in the 3600. And so now there were chips available, and we could therefore build it smaller and cheaper and hopefully a little faster. But at the same time, we started work on a single chip list machine, which was the Ivory, which was yet another architecture. Um, and then the very last thing of the original Symbolics company was the emulator for the, alpha, uh, for the Ivory on, that ran on the Alpha. And then Brad Parker, who's see, sitting back there, <laughs> wrote this absolutely marvelous hack that allowed that alpha emulator to run on uh, any 64-bit machine. And so that's how what I'm going to show on my laptop. So how did MIT, uh, sort of how did list machines come about at all? Well, in the 70s, and uh, people like Jerry can tell more <laughs> detail about that, um, research was running into a problem, AI research, because the Lisp resources were limited. Uh, PDP-10 didn't have a lot of address space. Uh, the instructions necessary for doing runtime type checking often s dwarfed the actual cost of doing the operation, so it wasn't very efficient. And a PDP-10 could, a researcher could easily use up a whole PDP-10 for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you know that was a little too expensive. So the first attempt was a machine called Cons, which wasn't ever built. Um, some of the ideas from it uh, were put into a machine called the Catter, which got built. Notice the, the name. Um, it was built in 79, and I don't know exactly how many were built at MIT. I've heard numbers anywhere from 8 to 12 or so. How many was right. Um, <laughs> and uh, they cost between 50 and 60K per researcher, and they were much better at doing Lisp software development than the pp 10 so they, they were a big win. But visiting researchers saw them and said, hey, we'd like some of these. And MIT didn't want to be in the business of manufacturing computers. So they licensed the CADR design to two startup companies, um, List Machines, Inc. and Symbolics. Um, Russell Nofsker, d you know, Tom Knight, Dave Moon, Dan Weinreb, Mike McMahon, and Bernie Greenberg were all at Symbolics. And Richard Greenblatt and uh, some other people, but I, I'm hazy on the names because I, I only worked at Symbolics. Uh, were at LMI. And each company started out selling essentially the CADR. And each company also uh, immediately started on a successor list machine. The, the CADR that, that Symbolics 
did was repackaged. We laid it out on PC boards and put it into an industrial you know, box, but it was essentially the same design. The Catter was more or less a vanilla 32-bit word machine, which w wasn't the, the most usual thing at the time. Um, but it had two great features. One was a very large microcode store, um, and that meant you could make a microcoded instruction set that was essentially a Lisp interpreter. So car was an instruction, uh, you know, as were lots of Lisp primitives. And it had large scratch pad memories so that this microcode could look up lots of stuff, and that was used for the type checking parts. And the, the other interesting feature was that you could microcompile a Lisp function into microcode. And the reason that worked was that there was a hardware uh, stack, function call stack, in the microcode. So I think it was only four deep. And so you could call the exact same micro instructions that implemented the car instructions after you had you know, fetched it, decoded it, and then dispatched off to those things as a subroutine called by your microcompiled larger function. So you could take your, your inner loop of, of some you know, computation and compile it directly into the microcode. The other really cool thing about the catter was that when it was halted, that is not fetching macro instructions and interpreting them, but you know, still powered on, you could actually access its memory through these parallel cables from another machine. So you had a debugger on another catter that could look at the stack and poke around in memory and figure out why you crashed. But it could also find your ZMAX uh, modified buffers and write them out, <laughs> which was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so both companies, as I said, started successor machines. And uh, LMI's successor machine was more or less the same architecture with faster technology. So they got a performance boost. Anyway, Symbolics' successor machine w was an attempt to do uh, an improvement on the architecture. And uh, the main improvement, there were many little ones, and I'll talk about some more of them, but the main improvement was to take the tags and put them in every word in memory. Some of the Catter floating point manipulations use 32-bit floating points with no tags. And the trouble is keeping track of those in registers and in the garbage collector where it was a pain, and it sometimes got it wrong. Uh, but by having the tags in every single word in memory, y y and by carrying the tags through the data path, and having special logic in the data path that could look up these tags, so what you had is, let's say you were doing an add instruction. You took the two operands and presented it to the integer adder logic. And you presented the two floating the operands to the single float you know, adder logic. And the tag checking hardware basically gave you, looked it up and gave you an answer saying, either use the integer as result, use the floating point result, or take a trap so you could co coerce one to the other and then restart the instruction correctly. Uh, they, they important feature of that was that even by having elided out the instruction fetch overhead for instructions to do tag manipulation uh, in the catter, you know, so it, it didn't have to do it as macro instructions, it, but it did it as micro instructions. So that it, in, in terms of microcycles, you did some tag checking and then you did some operating, tag checking, then operating. Whereas the 3600 was tag check and operate, tag check and operate every cycle. cycle. So you basically got moved the overhead for the runtime type checking from the time domain into the hardware domain. You had to spend 10% more gates. So the upshot was that the 3600 was almost exactly the same technology and number of gates as the, the LM2, but was four times faster. So one of the other things about um, the... So we had 36-bit words. That was what allowed us to put tags on every word. But we wanted to have 32-bit fixed nums and single floats. So that meant uh, something had to give. <laughs> and what gave is that there were two 16-tag ranges uh, set aside for fixed nums and for single floats, so that the low-order uh, four bits of the tag value were actually the higher-order four bits of the, the, the data value. That still left you know, a goodly number of tag bits around. Um, and as I said before, every word in memory had tags, which made the garbage collection a lot simpler. Um, there was hardware support for hashing that was used in method dispatch. Uh, that turned out to be not all that useful and, and was dropped. But there was also hardware support for ephemeral GC. And the, that took the nature of, if you stored an ephemeral pointer in a page that was not ephemeral, you remembered in a page table bit that you had done that. And so instead of having to chase roots and find all of these things, you had this oracle that said, this is the set of pages you have to scan for such things. Um, 
and that was a very big win. Um, there was also a support for a, what was called an address space number register, which was basically another eight bits tacked on to the virtual address. Um, all of the software in the list machine was in one address space, including all of the operating system routines, all of your device drivers, your compiler, your own code, all of the, the, the what are con you know would be considered utility processes. All, everything was in one address space, which made it very easy to share data among processes and things, but it made it um, hard to uh, separate data. <laughs> and one of our customers wanted to, to be able to do that and, and in you know, encouraged us and, in fact, so almost demanded that we add this address space register, and they were going to write the software to support it. They never did. We never did. It got dropped from later architectures. So the 36 hardware itself was five large boards like this, just to implement the processor. And um, then in addition to those five boards, there were um, another you know, set of large boards for the memory. And at the beginning, the memory was like 16K words, 36-bit words. And by the end, we had boards that were as high as 512K words. Um, and, and depending on the size ca cabinet, you could put you know, anywhere from you know, three or four to six or eight uh, memory boards in your, your machine. So you at the end, you could get a decent amount of memory. But at the beginning, the machines were really, really tiny. Um, there were color boards. Oh, sorry. Uh, the IFU, one of the, uh, those five boards that implemented the processor itself was intended to be the IFU from the very beginning. This is an instruction fetch unit that prefetched instructions, pre-decoded them, and pr you know, prefetched some operands and put them in sort of scratch pad memory so you could access them. But it was late, and it was very, very, very complicated and very, very tricky uh, to debug. So it actually didn't ship with the first 3600 model. So in, it, in the later models, there was 36XX, 36x0, and then there was a 36x5, and the 5 meant that you had an IFU, and it was quite a bit faster. Um, we also made color boards. Color at the time was a separate monitor. Uh, we made 8-bit color boards for CAD you know, drawing type applications, and 24 or 32-bit color for um, animation and rendering, uh, paint. Um, the one of the things about the color system, which was developed by the color division out in Westwood, California, was that they had ties to the movie industry, and so we had the ability to genlock to a house sync, which was unusual at the time for computer graphics systems. And moreover, we could uh, basically diddle our microcode easily. So some of the displays that you saw in some of the early Star Trek movies were done by list machines because we could uh, genlock to a 24 frames per second house sync. So it would be in sync with the cameras. Uh, we made an ar array processor board for doing high-speed floating point calculations. We did a 386 daughter board that you could basically use to load and test 386 programs. We did various interface boards to different uh, Unibus, GPIB, SCSI for controlling various instruments. Um, the 3600s came in really tall cabinets, like you know this tall, and then uh, slightly smaller cabinets, and then half-size cabinets. And more or less, the only difference was the amount of expansion you had. So as I said before, all the peripherals were um, discrete logic. So w the Ethernet was done out of logic gates, and the um, serial controller was done out of logic gates. But after a while, it became clear that you could get a much smaller product by using commodity chips. So while the biggest 3600s were this size, the biggest of the G machines were this size, you know, and there were smaller ones than any possible 3600. But it was exactly the same architecture. So, uh, and it, by putting the logic for the processor on gate arrays and by um, you know, using you know, commodity chips, or rearranging things a little bit, we got it down to two boards for a processor. And then at the same time that the G machine was being designed, we made the ivory chip, which was a single chipless machine. Um, it had several absolutely amazing innovations uh, for the time. Uh, it had 40-bit words, which meant that now you could have uh, not only 32 bits of data for fixed numbers and floats, but you could have 32 bits of address space. And this was 32 bits of words, which was significantly large for 1986, 87, whatever. But because it was a single chip, there were two features th of the previous machines that we had to, to lose. One was we couldn't have a loadable microcode. It had to be basically ROM burned onto the chip. So it had to be right the first time. And secondly, uh, it couldn't be very big. It couldn't have all of the stuff that the, the, the large microcode stores of the predecessor machines had in it. So things like Bitblit and 
big number arithmetic, which had been in the microcode on the 3600s, had to be moved out of microcode on the ivory chip. And the problem with that was that they really wanted a very high-speed access to moving lots of data around. So Dave Moon came up with this idea called bus address registers, which were sort of like a, uh, a single word, fetch ahead or right behind uh, channel. You, know, uh, you, you loaded it with an address, and in idle cycles on the bus, it would either fetch that and, and store it in, in a local register or write it out. And there were idle cycles on the bus because the instruction set consisted of half-word instructions. So when you fetched a word of instruction data from memory, you got two, two instructions. So that was, at minimum, two cycles. And so you, you had some idle cycles there, hopefully, that you could you know, send the data through. Um, another uh, innovation in the ivory was that we didn't have any constant tables. In, in all the previous architectures, for every function, if you wanted to push a constant to either pass to a, a function call or to use you know, some operation on it, you had an index in the instruction, which was some number of bits wide, that was an index into a table of constants that was attached to the function. The trouble is that that wasn't very many bits, and it was very easy to write a function that overflowed it. The compiler tried to break up such functions into sub-functions that had non-overlapping subsets of, of the constants in their tables, but it's pretty easy to you know, defeat that, and the, it got it wrong a lot. So for the ivory, instead of having a constant table, we said, OK, instructions have a tag that says, I'm an instruction word. Anything else that's in the instruction stream means push me onto the stack. So if you wanted a constant on the stack, you just included it in the instruction stream. But that caused a slight problem, because the constants were all full words, and the instructions were all half words. So now you had to have this. <laughs> Cute, again, uh, this was in invented by David Moon. Cute trick to, uh, for example, do the first half of, of an instruction, skip down to the next word, push that whole word, go back to do the second half of the previous word, and then skip over the full word to do the first instruction of the, <laughs> of the next word. And the encoding of those, the, the how to advance the PC was done by the coder code bits. The, the original use of the coder code bits was to allow you to uh, store n words of a list in n words. And not only that, you could store n words of a list in n words and have an array that pointed to the same storage so that you could index it as an array or operate on it as a list as you saw fit. Um, I was mostly involved in designing the VLSI tools that led to the ivory chip, so that in most of this time that I worked for some logs. So I know a lot about the, the whole design process. And it was sort of an example of what was great about the list machine. Um, each des designer had a, a list machine with his, th the entire design of the chip loaded up, and he was working on pieces of it uh, using tools that we had built. Um, none of the tools on Unix at that time were up to it. Um, so, and moreover, we used a, a methodology that was different. Instead of doing layout that was specific to a particular process, we did what we called uh, sort of generic layout. And then it, it, it knew that it was a two-level metal CMOS process, but it didn't know anything about the constraints. And we had a compactor tool that you fed it the exact um, dimensions that you needed for spacings and uh, surrounds and all of that. And it would take your design and squeeze in all the space and, and, and get it to the, the, the smallest layout given those constraints. And because of this methodology, we were able to do five different uh, revs of the chip on four different technologies, um, which was pretty amazing. We also had uh, all sorts of simulators. So we had a, uh, an instruction level simulator where you know, somebody said, this is how the instruction should work. We had a gate level simulator, logic simulator. And we had a transistor level simulator that sim you know, tra simulated the transistors as resistors and, and figured out what the thing was. And we even had SPICE which is a Fortran program that actually figures out the waveforms for the analog parts. And in fact, one of the cute things about SPICE was that we had a Fortran compiler on the list machine, but because the list machine has tags for everything, if you don't initialize the variable, you get a trap. And we found that there were whole bunches of bugs in SPICE because there were whole bunches of initi uninitialized variables <laughs> that got used. Anyway, the, the designers would come in every day, load patches, and, and work on their designs. But many times, the, when they loaded patches, 
uh, that would change radically, uh, you know, thousands of objects that they had. You know, they grew new slots, they changed, you know, types, they, uh, we, we loaded whole new uh, tools, we replaced whole new, to you know, old tools, uh, you know, and the designers just didn't care. They would come in, load patches, and continue working. And, you know, that was a pretty amazing... Uh, the other thing, the other strength of the Lisp machine was that um, we had super, uh, in addition to control, we had meta, super, and hyper bucky keys on both sides of the keyboard, and we had a three-button mouse. And the design system allowed you to draw, and you could click on any mouse button with any combination of these things, and they would do different stuff. So once the designers had actually learned how to use this, they could go wah, 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 really fast and, and just do amazing stuff in, in a, a very short amount of time. Um, not the, the modern interface style at all. Uh, anyway, um, so as a, as a validation of this des design process, the very, very first prototype um, rev of the chip, which was um, on a really huge die and, and would have been ruinously expensive to actually make, um, almost completely worked. The only real bug was that one of the transistors driving the virtual memory control signal that had to cross the entire chip was sized too small so that, th you know, basically uh, uh, out in the boonies it got noise. And so we couldn't turn on virtual memory, but everything else worked. And so for the trade shows that we went to with this, you know, the, the first few prototypes of this machine, we just packed it full of memory <laughs> and didn't turn on virtual memory. So the only other thing I want to say about this is that uh, we took about 10 to 12 man years to do the ivory chip. And the only comparable chip at, you know, contemporaneous to that was the Microvax at DEC, and I knew some people who worked on that, and their estimates were that it was 70 to 80 man years to do the Microvax. That, in a nutshell, is the reason that the Lisp machine was great, <laughs> the Symbolics Lisp machine. So another point is that if you were using Unix tools, uh, the, the standard thing is you take some internal structure that you've created in your tool, you thread it through the needle of, of piping it out to a single 8-bit stream, to pass to another tool which is going to take these 8-bit bytes and create some data structure and then operate on that. Whereas in the Lisp machine, we just handed a pointer to the data structure and each tool just walked, traversed it the way it wanted to and made annotations wherever it wanted to and that was it. So, so Symbolics added a lot of software. When we got the original system from MIT, it had you know, command lis Lisp listeners and it had Zmax, which is a, an Emacs-like editor written in Lisp and lots of individual tools like an inspector and band transfer and you know various things but and I'm going to demonstrate some of these things uh, Symbolics added a command processor and it has a fairly powerful model of, of how to do input output which was r invented by Mike McMahon for dynamic windows but w which is also used in Klim which was intended to be a portable equivalent um, and it has a, 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 lo a robust local file system. Um, Bernie Greenberg wrote that, and it had the uh, interesting feature that every word, every block written to disk had a, a couple of words at the beginning and the end that were called check words. They weren't like a checksum. But the point was they, they gave the unique ID of the file and the word displacement into the file. So if you read the wrong block off disk, you knew it. And in fact, I was once... Uh, working uh, in Chatsworth, where the manufacturing facility was, when one of their main file servers uh, had a disk that would give you block M when you ask for block N with about a 10% you know, probability. And all it took was two lines of code while the machine was running to have it retry a few times till it got the right thing. And then all it took was another six or so lines of code to uh, Basically, every time it touched something on the bad disk, write the same contents to a new disk that we hooked up. And so but just by uh, reading all the files in the file system, everything got migrated to the new disk, and then you just changed the configuration that pointed to the new disk, and everything was fine. There's not many file systems that you can say something like that about. Uh, more software. Uh, I'm not going to say anything in detail about them, but Suffice it to say, there was lots. There was a uh, compiler framework that was used to do C, Fortran, and Pascal. There was a whole separate uh, com compiler that did Ada. I, I, I believe that the, the first three shared a lot, and the Ada compiler was a totally separate uh, entity. And of course, there was a prologue as well. 
Um, uh, some of the debugger stuff I'll show you. There was a whole thing for the documentation. When you got a Symbolics list machine, there was about four feet of manuals. Those manuals came from the documentation system that was written on the list machine, and more was available on the list machine. Now again, these days, online documentation isn't much of a big deal, but back then, in the 80s, it was a big deal. Yes, and uh, not only that, you could click on examples and they would run. <laughs> uh, and of course, we had uh, other outside programs. We uh, Symbolics acquired Maxima and you know um, converted it to Common Lisp and uh, added lots more features. Uh, it was then spun off to another company. Uh, we wrote a, a rule-based system called Joshua that its main claim to fame was it, it was totally object-oriented and you could plug in uh, pieces for the database and for the truth maintenance system. And you, you basically, you could hook up it, hook it up any way you wanted, and it was a very powerful system. The um, there was a deaf system facility in the original um, MIT list machine, but it was totally rewritten and uh, in intensified uh, the system construction tool. And the basic idea is that you you could define systems that were collections of systems and load patches and you know distribute them and, and distribute patches over email uh, just whole lots of hair uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that uh, so the last thing that the original symbolics wrote so there, there were f three symbolics the first symbolics was a public company and in about 92 it filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy and then it sputtered on for a while and then, and then finally had filed for Chapter 7. Um, its assets were bought from the bankruptcy court by a, a, a Princeton firm called Princeton Capital. Uh, and they started a company called Symbolics Technology Inc. Uh, and I was hired as the, the developer for that company. And our main job was to bring out the next version of the emu uh, alpha emulator. The old Symbolics had, had gotten 1.0 out the door, but it w had many rough edges and didn't support things like status, which is the relational database, and didn't support a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and so the, the emulator, though, had a, a couple of cute features. One cute feature was that it, inst it pretended it was a newer rev of the alpha chip. So that meant the ivory chip, so that it, it could um, pretend to have these coprocessor registers, which really represented stuff that was done on the seaside in the life support code rather than done in fetched and emulated Lisp instructions. And the most uh, important part of that was the uh, scanning pages and transporting old uh, pointers to new space. Um, and the other cute trick was that instead of mapping the 40-bit words directly as 40-bit words into the virtual memory address of the alpha, it mapped the 32-bit parts contiguously and the 8-bit parts, all the tags, contiguously. So when you needed to, in C code, access a range of integers, for example, like in the communications buffers that allowed life support and the, uh, the list machine to exchange data, it was in the natural format that C expected it. So that was a cute idea. So the VLM stands for Virtual List Machine. The, the life support was written in C. And the emulator was written in what I call parenthesized alpha assembler. The idea there was these, this fairly large Lisp system that had lots of macros for little sub pieces of, of what had to be implemented to, to do the instructions. And those macros expanded into basically parenthesized alpha instructions. And then there was a mechanical translation into the format that the alpha assembl assembler wanted. And then you assembled them and you included that as an object in the, the actual executable. Um, the intention was that if you wanted to port it to another architecture, you would change those macro expansions to expand into parenthesized something else instructions. And in fact, there was an attempt at MIT to do that exactly that for the PowerPC 64-bit chip. And it got far enough, it, it got mostly done, it got far enough that you could actually ru run some things in the cold load stream, but it never quite worked. But uh, Brad back here had the brilliant idea to, instead of expanding into instructions for the native thing, he just expanded into subroutine calls to a little C backend that pretended it was an alpha. <laughs> And so that's the emulator that we're going to see running on this laptop. Um, 
and it's faster than any Lisp machine that ever existed on the planet, <laughs> uh, any real Lisp machine. Um, not on this laptop, but uh, believe me, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, so so now we're going to go to the demo. And the first thing I want to do is start up another X term and boot the Lisp machine. So I'm, I'm booting a, a particular world of mine uh, that uh, uh, I have to type the right things. Uh, that has a whole bunch of my own hacks in it. Um, but that's because I know, <laughs> know how to do things in that world. Uh, that's the one I, I typically use all the time. Uh, notice in the top bottom left uh, uh, appeared a, a minimized little window. That's the cold load stream window. Um, on a real live Lisp machine, it used the same bits as the bitmap display in a, in a mode that's very much like the consoles on Linux. That is, you know, you could switch to this area of the the bitmap or switch to this other one. And the cold load stream was a character only um, interface. And if the window system wasn't working. You could, um, you know, get get into the debugger there, figure things out, do a lot of commands. Uh, let me scroll back before you take pictures, so you can see the Symbolics Open Generator 2.0. Um, the notice that as I move my mouse around here, uh, different things highlight, and underneath. Uh, so at the very bottom, you'll see there's a date and time clock, and that that's where it says CL user, that's the package that the current process is in, and where you see user in back put, that's the state that the current process is in. Um, but above that, you'll see this two two black lines uh, that that show what m mouse clicking certain clicks will do. So it says right now mouse left would show a list of programs, but if I move it up to here, mouse left will select the document examiner activity, which is the the, the activity that lets you view the documentation. And the one of the main points I want to make in the demo is how that works. But even so, as I move over here, n you see lots of different things going. Plus, underneath it says, to see other commands, press Shift, Control, Meta. Uh, so here I am. I'm over this uh, Select D to select the document. By the way, the, um, the lozenge select that's right under the cursor, that represents a key. On the Symbolics keyboard, there's a whole bunch of keys. So there was a select key, a function key, and there were bunches of modifiers. I already mentioned super meta and hyper. But there was also symbol, and that allowed you to type like Greek letters or less than or equal as one character. Um, and all of those keys uh, did things that it's very hard to map those to modern systems because there's just not enough keys. And moreover, most GUIs usurp enough of them that you don't have enough left over to do it. So one of the things I first have to do is log in as me. And that will set up the keyboard the way I want. And um, so again, I'm going to go up here. And, and notice I'm highlighted here. I'm going to push down the control key. And notice two things happened. One, the, the text at the bottom in the black changed. It now says control mouse left will mark a region starting with this position. But the, the highlighting also changed because now it's only highlighting the, the, the letter P. Um, and the reason for that is that on the list machine, the C connection between the characters that, play dis that appear on the output display and the objects that engender them are not broken. That connection is, is remembered. And so, uh, for example, if I make a, a, sim a list, uh, if I can type, uh, well, yeah, this keyboard is being a little balky. It's also not the angle I'm used to typing at it. Uh, list. The symbol A, the string B, and the number 1, 2, 3. Well, it would have been 1, 2, 3. So I have, th I have this nice little object. If I present that object as a, an expression, which is a very general purpose type, notice one thing. Uh, as soon as I type the close parenthesis, um, it finished the form. Because we're sitting at a command prompt, which is waiting for either a command or a Lisp form to evaluate. This is a read eval print loop. Um, and so 
because I typed open parentheses in some stuff, it knew I was typing a form, and as soon as I typed the closed parentheses, it knew the form was finished, so it evaluated it. Um, so the presentation started exactly to the right of that parentheses. Um, if I try to accept now something of type string, uh, notice when I move over here, the string is highlighted by the mouse, and I can click on it to accept that string, but the A and the 123 aren't. Uh, let's click on the string and get it. Um, if I instead say I want to accept an expression, if I can type it again, now not only is the B highlighted, but the 123 and the A and indeed the whole thing. Um, and th the reason uh, the it this when I did the, ac the present, I got back this displayed presentation object. And so I'm going to describe that by clicking middle. Uh, and you'll see that it has a, a recursive structure. And each little text displayed presentation object represents a little piece of the, that presentation that was displayed on the string and keeps the mapping between what's on the, the screen and the data. And that allows me to do cute tricks like if I go up here and do control meta right click, I can type 42. And now if I type foo, it's been changed. Uh, when I got, what if I type accept expression and click on the whole object up here where I presented it, uh, it is indeed foo. So the the what the command prompt is doing is it's it's trying to see. I, are there objects that are visible on the screen which can be translated into reasonable commands or reasonable arguments to commands? So um, I can type the beginning of a command, so I'm going to type st space, and it completed for me because it knows that all of the things that start with st space have an a following them, but it didn't complete very far because there's multiple possibilities. But if I type g space, it now knows that it's a start GC command that I was trying to do because that's the only command that, that fits all those criteria. Um, and then it prompts me for some keywords. Now, this paren keywords is what's called a noise word. It's, it's a prompt, but it's not really part of the output because if I, if I hit rub out, it goes away. If I type it again, it comes back. So it's there to help you, you know, guide you along the, the path of, of getting the command arguments, but it, it doesn't get in your way. If you don't know what keywords it's wanting, you can type control slash and it lists them all. And in fact, I can uh, click on one to supply it because remember now I'm in a context where I want a keyword. And so it knows that those things are um, mouse sensitive and, and can be used. And so I'll say, yes, I want to turn on the ephemeral GC. Now if I type control slash to see what keywords are available, notice the ephemeral one isn't there anymore because it knows I've actually supplied it to this command. So this type of intelligent command completion, um, it, it's, it's very hard to explain, but it, it, it quickly gets very automatic to use. And so I'm going to say dynamic, yes. So I, yes, it, it is. Uh, there's nothing, I, I don't know of any other system that has anything like this. Uh, Klim does too, but Klim got its ideas from this. <laughs> um, so now I turned on the garbage collector, but nothing happened. Well, that's because usually we don't garbage collect until we need to. So I'm going to actually turn, actually cause it to garbage collect. And I want to show you another feature. Yeah, uh, except I can uh, spell and talk. GC flip now. So as soon as I type the closing paren, it's going to happen. So I want you to look where it says user input. And notice it changes to run because now we're in the run state, but we got these little bars underneath. There's a bar underneath the run that's called the run bar, coincidentally enough. There's a bar between the run bar and the one that's under common lisp si, which is the package that we're currently running in. Uh, that's the disk bar, which we don't see. And the, the bar that we're seeing right now is, is the transport bar. And there's a scavenging bar that comes to the left that should appear momentarily as we start garbage collecting. So the the, the idea of the garbage collector on the Lisp machine is that it's written in Lisp. It has to run while you're running, so it can't stop <laughs> the world. So it's a copying garbage collector. And what you do is you take all of the memory that you've got objects in that you want to garbage collect, and you create another space that's the same size in case all of them happen to be non-garbage. 
and you call the old one old space and you call the new one new space and then you arrange for the hardware to make a trap so that every time you touch a pointer in the old space it gets copied to new space by the trap handler so anything that touches any object in old space will copy it to new space um, now the, the list machine has a, a fairly large array of primitives, including locatives into the middle of objects and, and arrays. So you can have a pointer that points into the middle of something. So that has to keep working because remember you have lots of programs running. So what the garbage collector does is it leaves behind what are called GC forwarding pointers. So when the locative pointing to the address that was the address of the object in old space hits one of those, it says, don't look here, look over there. <laughs> and so then the, the, the data gets actually fetched from the new space location. And so in the background, all you have to do is have something that wanders through all of the possible paths to, to known objects. And once it's gotten all the way to the end of that process, you know that everything's been copied from old space to new space that's accessible. And you just declare, oops, the old space is, is done, it's free. And the new space now is, is, and while you're doing this, new programs, uh, out g uh, new consing happens in new space, of course. So programs can continue to run while the garbage collecting is happening. So notice w while I was talking, it finished. Uh, it gave us these little things in square brackets. These are called notifications. Um, they're asynchronous, and uh, for a Lisp listener, it, it doesn't hurt to have them pop up because. If, if you were sitting just at a command prompt, it'll repaint the command prompt and you, you haven't lost anything. If you were in the middle of typing a command and one of these happens, it blasts the notification and then retypes what you typed because it knows how much you typed, so that doesn't hurt anything. But for other programs, you might not want those to happen, so they can be turned off. And there's a separate uh, notification window, if I could type, that, that they're all collected in. So you can go back and, and find out about these later. Or if you're in a context where they can't be uh, blasted to the screen that you're looking at, you can get a pop-up notification window that's created on the fly with the, the notification. Um, so um, one of the other things about the list machine uh, that I wanted to demonstrate is that, so when I said present before, I could have typed control shift A, and that gives me the list of all the, the you know, ar arguments. Um, all of the names of local variables and arguments are always saved. There is no such thing as a difference between a debug build and an optim build on the list machine. You always have symbols for everything. So when you're describing an object, you get the names of the slots. Uh, you can click middle on any slot and you'll get the description of, of, of that thing. And you know, can, so you can go click, 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 chasing a chain of, of pointers faster than I can describe it. Um, but in addition to this, which is, you know, there are other systems that can do that. You can do meta shift A, which instead of <laughs> just giving you the, the short description, gives you the actual documentation from the, the, the manual. Um, so I'm going to actually go to the document examiner, um, which because this is a smaller screen than usual. Uh, so anyway, um, so these things down here are, are the document uh, sections, and we can search for them. So, so sh show candidates for present, let's say. And it lists all of the things that match uh, present. Uh, and so there's, l there's a lot of, lot of choices here, m many of which you probably have no idea what they mean. Certainly, I don't know what all of them mean. So you can what you can do is you can go click middle on them, and you get a little uh, graphic that says where these guys are. So you can find the location in the documentation that, that actually matches you know, what you're interested in. Now, this is better with a bigger screen. So I apologize. And notice when you do this, um, it remembers the level that you came from, and it shows you the detail of the next higher level, but it, 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 it elides some. So if I click middle here, I won't be seeing all of the stuff, so it doesn't get infinitely complicated because the whole point of this graphical display is to make it easy for you to select locally in the context of the documentation to get to the right place for and then of course when you when you get there, you just click on it and you you read the documentation now, as I said before, this documentation has you know graphics drawings in it, it has uh, links to other you know so each section is basically a link to the other one, just like so using data arguments. Uh, present 
uh, it highlights and I click on there, I go to the documentation of present. Um, but it also can have examples that, that it can run. So, uh, and the, the program that allows you to create those is called Concordia and it, it again was written at Symbolics and it allows you to have markup. So if I say medx add section, oops, if I could spell section, it would help. This keyboard is being wonky. Well, okay. Cr maybe it's create section. Uh, one of the other problems is that because this is a laptop, um, many of the, the keyboard layout keys are intended to be used on the keypad. And of course, now I have to type functions something to get those. Uh, anyway, I can create a record. Record title foo for demo. And it's the say, oops, well, that's not good. Ah, well, at least we get to see the debugger. So uh, I was going to show the debugger in a different way, uh, but uh, why not? Uh, so once we get an error, we go into the debugger. And the debugger is really uh, one of the mo more powerful aspects. Um, again, it uses the same presentation type thing. So if I type control B, I show the backtrace. And so this, this is the, you know, this guy down here at the bottom called this guy, who called this guy, who called this guy. And they're all mouse sensitive because I can go to any particular one. So this is not actually a particularly interesting uh, one. So let me, let me go uh, to the one that I was going to uh, demonstrate the debugger on because I have some. So the, the way I was going to demonstrate going to the debugger is that there's actually a bug in this. Uh, remember when I was mousing over, uh, over these things? Oops. Somehow I'm not in the right context. When I was mouse, oh, one of the other things I wanted to show is notice as I move over the scroll bar, there's this horizontal line of short dots. Um, this allows me to say, I want this line up at the top of the screen, or I want that line at the bottom of the screen. And it, it does it directly. Um, modern user interfaces, you have to scroll. And of course, there's this feedback loop. And if you're doing it over X or a slow network connection or the CPU got way faster, you know, it's sometimes hard to get it to, to go exactly right. And, uh, you know, but here you say directly, move this to here. You know, and move that to there. I really like that. It's not very common. And of course, it works in the horizontal scroll bar as well. So it, it's, it's less useful for text than it is for graphics. Uh, but anyway, the, that was just a, an aside because what I was trying to do is get back to the beginning. So when I was mousing over these things, I was carefully avoiding mousing over this, see where it says loaded from, and it gives me a path from the world name. If I mouse over that, I go into the debugger too. And uh, this is a, a slightly more interesting thing to look at. So the error we got was we got an unclaimed message. That is, we sent a message to an object at, that didn't handle it. So these first three are all for handling that. So this is the guy who did it. So control E will take us to the editor with the function there. And we can look at it and, and we'll see that uh, this is a function called fep path name real host and it's given a path name. And we send that path name a host message which gives us back something that we also send a host message to. And you, on, the, on the original list machines, the fep, the front end processor was a 68,000 that loaded the microcode and all the world files load were on the file system that was a very simple file system that that little brain 68,000 could understand, which was called the FEP file system. And so there was one FEP file system per disk. So you had FEP0 for the first disk, FEP1 for the second disk, FEP2 for... And all of them, of course, resided on one machine. So when you have a FEP path name and you send it a host, you get one of these FEP0, FEP1 things that indeed can support having a host message sent to them to tell them the real list machine host, right? But what we were given, uh, if we look at the frame, uh, is we were given this path name, which is a Unix path name, because this is a Unix emulator, a Linux emulator. So, and the world is on Linux, and so uh, a, one of those doesn't know how to do this double indirection. So um, we, we can fix it, um, but it's probably not the fault of this guy because this guy is clearly expecting only a FEP path name. So whoever's calling him is uh, the one in, in, in error. 
So uh, I just said go down to the next stack frame. Notice we have all the local variables uh, with values. We could click middle on them to describe them to look at the data structures. Uh, and I can type control E to go to its source, which is in a different file. And notice this is actually only a, a piece. This is a macro. Control shift M shows us the macro expansion. And this is the tester method that's the middle part here uh, that we're looking at. And it comes from this, this tester clause here. And what it's doing is it's saying, get, if you take the path name, get its real host, and see if that's not the local host. And if so, make the tester method return true. What the tester is doing is, as you're moving the mouse around uh, over these objects, there's all these possible translators that are live that could translate into a command. And the, the tester's job is to see if this particular object is applicable to, to this translator. And so the, if the world was on your own machine, uh, the command that it's trying to do, which is copy world to this machine, wouldn't make any sense. So the tester should return nil. But if the world is a path name on some other machine, you might want to copy it here, right? So, so it makes sense to pr you know, make that a possible command. So the, the issue here is, of course, that uh, this assumes that all uh, world path names are FET path names. So we can fix it. Type P path name. And let's say I don't remember exactly what the type of a FET path name is. One of the nice things about the, the editor is that you can always go into a command loop. So we can just perform an experiment. Parse path name. Pep zero foo dot bar, and then do type of that, and there we have it. Now I'm going to use that control mouse click that we saw before, because that allows me to actually mark the characters that are that presentation. Notice before I did control, the whole thing was highlighted because I had a connection to the object, but by pressing down control, I'm now talking about the individual characters. So I can, I can slice and dice whatever way I want. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the individual characters is the only thing you'd get on a, on a traditional uh, output. Uh, and then I just put it on the kill ring. Um, I can hit resume, which is a hard one to type on this keyboard. Uh, I think it's this one, yeah. And uh, yank that back in and add a closing parenthesis. Now, Control shift c will recompile it. And so it compiled it, a new version of this whole macro expansion, which included several functions. And going back to the debugger, sorry, what? Oh, you're right. It should be if or when, right? Yes, you're right. It it would have it would have made a problem, which we would have found in the debugger, and <laughs> we would have fixed it. But okay, yes, you're right. Um, it's hard doing this and talking at the same time. Uh, anyway, so now we're back here. I can just reinvoke this function, and it's going to invoke the newly created one. So I do that, and it didn't work. Sorry, what? Ah, you're right. So when I think is correct, because I want to say nil in all cases, except if it's a FEP. Oh, no, it, yeah. It, when it's a FEP path name, uh, then this test is the answer. Otherwise, it's always nil. And I, I did leave out a paren. Um, uh, what? Uh, I don't know what I just did. Oh, it, it does. Uh, it's blinking the matching one. And I, I um, if I were to save it out, it would have told me I didn't have uh, balanced parentheses. And I'm, I'm not going to save it out. But um, uh, the next step that I'm going to demonstrate would have also told me. So uh, anyway, we can go down to the presentation handler and, and run it again. Uh, Mm. 
Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but the, the 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 next thing I wanted to show also sort of depends on getting it right. Um, if this were symbolics and I was uh, actually in, in charge of fixing this bug, I would just say start patch, medx start patch in the e editor. And I would create a new patch version for this particular system. It knows which system. It remembers which files you know, uh, each function comes from and it remembers which systems loaded those files. And so when I say medx start patch, it would tell me that this needs to be patch one, two, three to the, some particular system. But there were each system had a, a notion of, of who owned it. And since I'm not at the symbolic site, I can't do that. But I can do uh, start private patch, which means my own local patches, which I can load from my list in a minute. I can say local demo, oops, demo patch, which is Olympus running on this list machine. And then I give it a comment, uh, fix world uh, mouse over blowout. And so now it's opened up a file for me, and then I add add this add patch, this function. And I can say what this function is. Does only check only call fep specific function on fep path names, and then when I say finish patch. It will write out that file for me. Uh, this is another example of the object-oriented uh, except present thing. This is a, a set of values. I can click on any of them. I, it's already got me as the patch author, but uh, a lot of times if you were logged in as somebody else and you wanted to record that, that it was you who made the patch, not the person you were logged in, as you could change that. You click on one of these. Uh, you type in the new value. Uh, every time you've changed something, it gets redisplayed sort of behind your back. And so if you click on one of these yes, no things, that means now there needs to be more parameters. Um, they just magically appear. Or if you click on something that means fewer, they magically disappear. Um, it's a very comp, a again, it's a very different from the, the current model user interface interaction, but a very powerful one. It's much more cumbersome to explain than to, to learn to do. Um, and so it writes out the file. And now I can put load that file into my um, init file. If you do a show herald command, it lists all the private patches. You can see I already have lots and lots and lots and lots of them. Uh, so yes, uh, that was going to be the next thing. So um, select E. So the patch, demo patch. And this brings up another point. Uh, so it, it, it records as comments uh, what patches are loaded in the system that you've currently got so that in case it doesn't work on somebody else's system, they might have a clue to knowing why. But then it has this uh, first form here is the FEP files patched, the files patched in this patch file tells you the source file that the function came out of. So I if you took, uh, made a patch file that was functions from five different things, you'd have five different files in here. And the note private patch is the comment that I gave for the whole overall patch. And then each patch section has uh, more or less an, an entire attribute list again. And the, the reason for that is that the symbolics list machine allowed multiple Lisp syntaxes to coexist, even ones that used the same package name for different semantics. So, <laughs> so the original function, uh, the system was written in Zeta Lisp, um, and it has a whole bunch of functions that have one semantics, and then Common Lisp came along, the CLTL1 Common Lisp came along, and Symbolics uh, adopted that and made some extensions to that and called it Symbolics Common Lisp. So now there's the exact same functions, but they have different semantics. Uh, and there's the exact same user package that inherits from the two of different ones with different semantics. Uh, so the package system is, is, is fairly elaborate. Um, then there was uh, you know, CLTL2 and uh, ANSI Common Lisp. Uh, Symbolics never was around long enough to actually implement all of ANSI Common Lisp, so it was called Future Common Lisp, you know, the directions that ANSI was going. But, but they all exist at the same time. The, there was, for that 386 board, there was a Lisp written by uh, Paul Robertson called Chloe. Uh, it also has different syntaxes. You can say, I want to be in a Chloe buffer, and now the, the, the code that you compile there will act as if it were running on that 386 machine as well. So uh, it allowed, instead of picking one and restricting you to one, it allowed you to choose any one you want. 
And because you can make a patch that comes from different files, each patch section has to remember all of that stuff. So you can be putting together one single patch file that has you know, pieces from the user package in th three different common lists. <laughs> um. uh, so uh, I think, what time is it? Uh, oh, so uh, I, I think I've used up all my time. Uh, there are plenty more things I can show. Uh, does anybody have a, a preference? Uh, well, so it, it the um, so what I what I patched was uh, I, I actually patched the wrong thing. Um, it, it copies in the the the, the, the st when I said uh, add patch, I was in the middle of a function. It just copies that function in the modified buffer. So normally, if I were a developer. I would both save out a new version of the file that I modified so that future releases would get that fix, and I would make a patch. The patch would only include the modifications. Um, if that was a, an official patch for that system, you just say load, load patches, and it would get, get included in everybody in, at your facility. Um, if it gets released later, um, it could be released as still as a patch. So if you had version number X of a system and it had went up to patch 42, and then you know six months later we released system the same system and now we're up to patch 101. You, if you didn't make a new major version of the system, you would just get the new patches, and, and then people out at the other sites that got the distributions would get that patch. But nor most normally, when you distributed something a, a new, you would build it a new version from scratch. So then you'd have version 43 with no patches. Uh, but in any case, it would remember which version of the file the, the code came from. The list machine had version number file system. So every time you wrote a file, the version number incremented. And so the, the fact that it remembered that I was editing version XYZ of the file is unique globally uh, for the owner of that system. Uh, so let me. I, so one of the things that I, I, I wanted to dis de describe before is that when, when you present something, you don't actually have to uh, have it only be characters. So I can say object circle type string and uh, do graphics with room for graphics, graphics, draw a circle. And if I, don't, if I don't remember exactly what the draw circle arguments are, uh, 40, 40, 20, filled, nil. I've presented the string circle as this graphics thing. And if I say accept a string, notice it's mouse sensitive. And if I click on it, I get circle. <laughs> so you can present anything any way you want. And um, it, it's it one of the, the reasons that dynamic windows was originally thought to be list machine specific is that it, it, like many other features of the list machine, made use of the hardware when it could. So in the middle of drawing things and creating these presentation objects, there's, there's lots of them created which may not survive the interaction. So when we did that menu uh, at the end of uh, defining the patch, there were lots of little bits and pieces created that when I said end, all, all went away. Uh, but some of them might have had to survive. So those are all are created as local variables, but they're the ones that might have to be copied out when you exit the stack frame uh, can be marked with the cutter codes. And the basically the cleanup handler for cleaning up a stack frame knew to find those and 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 copy them into the heap. Um, and this was a this made it fairly efficient to do a lot of things that you would you know wa not want to do. Uh, 
again, this is efficient in the context of 1982 machines, when, <laughs> when they were slow and there was not much memory, and when you did things that took a lot of memory, you were likely to do paging. Um, these days, you know, who cares? <laughs> but but that's, that's not the only example. For example, uh, when, you, when you mark stack frames on the, on the ivory, those are also marked with cutter codes, the beginning of a stack frame, so you can quickly scan and find the stack frames. Um, There is a, a fairly uh, powerful networking facility. So uh, we could uh, talk to, to you know, different hosts in different ways. Um, files uh, were objects th that were generic, and the syntaxes, you, know, you, you knew from this host that it's a, let's say, a, a top 20 host. <laughs> So it had this kind of path name syntax, and this host was an ITS host, and it had this kind of path name syntax. And so you could parse them specifically and put them in a generic format, and then uh, all of the usages, like the editor, would take the generic format and, and piece together what it needed, and then display them in the, the path name specific syntax. So e even if you had never seen a... Uh, a top 20 path name, as soon as you added that to the system, now ZMAX could use it. And moreover, n the file system service could be given by FTP, it could be given by FTS, F NFS, it could be given by uh, the Lisp Machine file specific uh, file system thing called N NFile. Um, and so when you described a host to the namespace system, you, g you said all the possible ones that you could and you had all the possible ones loaded that you knew how to do, and it fi figured out what was the best one it could use sort of dynamically. Um, and again, th in the early days, this was, this was quite unusual. Um, read image file. So I'm going to show uh, one more thing, and then I think I'm going to quit. Uh, but before I do that, uh, so I, I mentioned before that we had we had uh, the, a C compiler. Um, I'm going to, I had a more elaborate version of this uh, planned, but yeah, image file. So I'm going to read this image file. It's a JPEG. Notice when it starts reading, uh, I, I, I got the value of this using I independent JPEG group star variable, which was nil. And then I set that uh, symbol to T because I wanted to have it use this. I'm going to go to peak, and I'm going to interrupt that this process, I hope. Uh, with the debugger. So I can, I can debugger any process while it's running. I can interrupt any process while it's running. I can continue, but um, so I, I waited too long. So let's do it again. Uh, I I talk talk to uh, I, I I oops. So notice we're in a st C frame, uh, and we're seeing C variables. And I can type Control E. Uh, oops. Well, if if I had uh, prepared correctly, um, I could have actually gotten the sources for this are on a uh, list machine file server just in the floor below. But uh, unfortunately, I'm coming in from a, a subnet that it doesn't know that I'm allowed to use, so I can't. Can I? But anyway, it would show me the C in the editor buffer. I could recompile it and continue from it the same way. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there.